uh, what am I? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank because I just thought about something just now. Hi, I'm your host, Mick Spikey, here on Canvases and Queens. Two artists exploring one theme relating to drag and art. We have big artists here with us. Today on the show, we'll dive deep into the subject of merch. Grab your brushes because it's time to spill some tin. And once again, it's me, Mick Spikey, here on Canvases and Queens. The fashion vampire is here. It's Bibardis! Pew, pew, pew! Hello, hello, hello. Hi! How are you? Hi, I'm horrible. <laughs> How are you? Oh no, okay, I'm sad to hear. I have to mention this. I feel like I've known you as long as I've done digital art, but this is the first time we're actually talking to each other now. Yeah, it's been like a while. We've been on the Drag Race fan art thingy like a while ago, back in the 1500s. So it's kind of crazy that we've known each other for so long. Thanks for making time to talk to me today. So I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Yes. We'll start the show in Act 1. And this is the part of the show where we look closely at some of your work. And so maybe I thought I can get you to start with a quick description of the very first drag portrait that you did. Yeah, so that was back when I was still doing watercolor. And this drawing specifically was um, of my friend, well, now friend, Ghost Electra, that is a drag queen from Berlin slash Paris. Um, and I was really obsessed with her like way of doing high femme drag in a very like goth punky way with a beard so i just like drew her we became friends and we're still friends to this day so yeah that was my very first drag portrait wow you know what's surprising that i didn't know that you did watercolor fan art yeah at all you know yeah i used to only do that i only started digital in like 2018 what were you drawing around that time and what made you decide to jump into doing a portrait of a drag queen Oh, so at the time, I think I was drawing very, like, fantasy girls. It was that era of galaxy art that was all over social media and in stores where everyone was wearing hideous galaxy prints and stuff like that. So I vividly remember I was painting a lot of that with watercolors because it's the easiest thing to paint. Um, So I was doing a lot of, like, that, but I was so horrible at actually using color that everything came out murky and just gray. So at some point I was just like, you know what, I'm going to lean into the like black and gray, just bland stuff. And Ghost Electra at the time was dressing up in a lot of gray toned, grayscale outfits. And I saw that, I saved it. I was like, that's a lady, kind of, with a beard. I was into it. It was very queer. I was like visually attracted to it and I drew it and never looked back. I said, no, that's all I do. I just draw ladies with beards. <laughs> Was Drag Race on at that time? Were you aware of the show RuPaul's Drag Race? It was definitely on, but Romania is kind of like a bit behind with pop culture, let's just say that. So it takes like a couple years, up to a decade for whatever to reach all the way back to Romania. So I was not aware of it necessarily, but I was that kind of kid that was just like on YouTube or drawing all the time, hiding from everyone. Um, I've stumbled upon a video of Bianca Del Rio reading Willem, I believe. And I wasn't really thinking about it like, oh, these are drag queens. I was just like, oh, this content on YouTube is really funny, so I'm just going to watch it. And then I got into Drag Race, and here we are. (laughs) Nothing's changed. (laughs) At all. So uh, maybe you can share a little bit about your first drag race portrait. Um, I think this is the one of Milk, is that correct? Yeah, so um, I don't remember much about this portrait, to be honest. The only thing that I do remember about it was the feeling that I had when Milk actually saw it. She was the first ever, like, drag race queen um, to ever notice my account and, like, comment on it and repost it and, like, like it and all that stuff. And a repost went a long way back then because 
that drawing specifically kind of kick-started my entire career. Like, I give that drawing and Milk a lot of credit for this because you have to remember for, like, a 16-year-old kid, the influx of new followers that I had and comments and likes and all the stuff, that was, like, crazy because I was in Romania doodling with watercolors and random stuff that my mom brought home. Like, I didn't even think that I would get noticed by them. So it, that was the one drawing that kind of made me go like, oh, maybe I can actually do more of this because this is fun. So, yeah. Do you remember if this was the time that we started talking to each other? I'm scared. Was I a dick to you? <laughs> no, 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 no. You were very nice to me. Um, but I remember when we first started noticing each other on Instagram, I feel like we were having the same number of followers or trajectory, I think. I remember you told me, you're like, by the end of this year, I'm going to get 10,000 followers or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, 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 let's do this, let's do this. And then <laughs> I was watching the numbers grow and I'm like, okay, well, yeah, you do this, you do this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I feel like I kind of remember that. <laughs> now looking back at it, it's a bit of a douche move to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get these number and you're not, boo-boo. Yeah, to be honest, you've always been like such a cheerleader to my account. <laughs> yeah, that's my my role on social media. But um, I mentioned that story because um, when you say that you got that wave of following, I wasn't too sure whether you're talking about that particular wave that I saw. That influx that you're talking about, it was definitely later on because I do remember I had like several big steps in my following growth, I guess. The milk following influx was more of the influx that made me want to do more. But yeah, I think that influx that you're talking about was definitely when I started doing digital art. So it's after that. Before we move on to act two, maybe just share about your first digital piece and how you came about this particular artwork. I think this is a portrait yeah, of... of Trixie Mattel? Yes, it is. So this one, looking back at it, it looks so bad. But um, this one is the very, very first digital piece that I've ever done. It was when I had just received my digital tablet, um, the one that I still have to this day, that I still draw on 24-7. Um, I know I like saved up so much money from tiny little watercolor portraits that I was doing either online or for family, friends, because um, I was seeing some like content on YouTube about digital art and what you can do with it. And I was like, I want to do that. But obviously, like we were very poor growing up. So it was kind of like weird to try to explain to my mom how I'm saving up money to buy this fancy screen that allows me to draw on it because I'm unsatisfied with paper. <laughs> So yeah, that drawing was the very first thing, like the day that I got my tablet, I sat down and I was like, okay, let me figure this out. I had many breakdowns while I was drawing that because I have this issue with whenever I start any new hobby or skill or anything, if I'm not immediately good at it, I drop it. Um, so like I had many, many breakdowns while I was drawing that piece and I was so unhappy with it. But um, eventually I got around with it and I was like, okay, great. Like, maybe I don't hate this as much. I'm going to give it another go. And then I like did this Trixie piece and I posted it and people liked it. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to do more. And I did. And look at me now. <laughs> wow. You're moved to digital. You're like, screw watercolor. <laughs> Who has time to mix water anymore? And then, yeah, you decided to jump into this. Okay, that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, how long were you drawing drag queens uh, traditionally before you moved on to digital? Do you remember? Ooh, I don't remember the exact time frame, to be honest. But I think I got my tablet in 2018 or 17. Um, so I want to say, like, I was drawing drag queens traditionally for, like, a year, year and a half. Max. So anyway, viewers at home, just remember that we have bills to pay to and tablets to buy. So pay your artists. Hello. Literally. So yeah, we put a lot of money into our equipment. That's why we charge um, the price that we charge. Um, so don't question it. Yep. So we've come to act two of the show. And this is the part of the show where we dive deeper into a selected topic or theme 
relating to art and drag. And today, I'm so excited uh, because we're talking about merch. Ooh. And there's nobody else better to talk to about this topic than Bibardis because you are dominating the drag queen merch scene. So I'd be stupid to talk about this topic with anybody other than you. What do you think about it? I didn't really think I was that big of a thing in the merch <laughs> industry until earlier this year where I kind of looked at my clients. And then I noticed like, yeah, I, I definitely kind of take a lot of work. So sorry to everyone else. I just guess people <laughs> like me more. <laughs> I think I'm 70% sure if you are walking around DragCon you will run into a piece done by you, so... Oh, definitely. Like, Dragon for sure. I feel like for a couple of years now, I've had at least one piece at every Dragon, which is kind of crazy to think about. And I didn't really notice that until in 2022 when I went to Dragon UK. Um, so I was just walking around and I would just... Like, talk to myself and be like, oh, there's my drawing. Oh, there's my drawing. Oh, I did that one. So it's kind of, like, crazy to do that. But it's kind of, like, I can't complain. Like, I'm very happy and grateful. So Yeah. How does it feel to walk through somewhere uh, knowing that you had some hands in all this? I'm guessing not everybody might know that you are the artist other than the queens, maybe. It's kind of weird sometimes because... Whenever I work on a piece, sometimes it takes like months for it to be actually produced. And like, especially for Dragon, they usually commission the pieces like months in advance. So I kind of forget about um, the fact that I worked on that piece. Like, especially last year when I went physically to Dragon, I was like, oh, when did I design that shirt? I don't remember that. Like, but I recognize it's my drawing because I remember doing it. So sometimes it's kind of so, like, such an out of body experience um yeah if this story tells me anything is that you are overworked uh maybe you should take a break <laughs> i wish i could afford a break but i <laughs> the bill is gonna be paid because london is expensive yeah maybe give some jobs to the other um starving artists okay <laughs> listen if i could i would like pull a little mean girls and break my little crown and give it into <laughs> pieces but i can't control who my clients pick and <laughs> I can't say no because I like money too and I'm starving as well. So Girls gotta eat. Girls gotta eat. Anyway, um, I love that you're here because I feel like you have so much experience working on merchandising, especially uh, drag queen merchandising. So maybe I should ask you um, some questions. I hope that you might provide some insight. So um, if, say, I'm an artist that's just entering digital art, drawing drag queens, I want my work to be picked up for a merch. So what advice will you give an artist to think about if they want their stuff to be picked up to become merch? Oh, that's an interesting question. So I think the most important part is to think of your social media as a portfolio and include as much diversity and versatility in your work on your page. Because you, as a merch designer, you want to be able to cater to a, as wide of the audience as possible and um, showcase how many styles you can do. If you can approach maybe different aesthetics um, while still maintaining your aesthetic as an artist, like showcase how versatile you can be. Um, don't draw the same thing over and over again, even though you might really enjoy that. It's not really sustainable as a merch illustrator because clients are all types of people. They're different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different everything. They have different aesthetics. Definitely practice as much diversity as you can. Um, practice as many aesthetics as you can because what you want as a merch designer is to take the client's aesthetic and merge it with your aesthetic to create a design that kind of shows off mostly the client but also you as an artist so definitely versatility in your portfolio is the most important thing 
that's a very good advice. Um, you're almost saying like draw it with an understanding that some queens will be looking at it and they want to know that you can represent them. Yeah, for sure. You have to put yourself in the position of the client. If you go on someone's page and they do a really nice, I don't know, gothy, like punky, spooky, ooky illustrations and you as a drag queen, you are, I don't know, something like Rockham Sakura. You're not going to like instantly be like oh okay let me commission this artist because i really like their style so if you also do like to draw very colorful types of drag or whatever showcase that even if that's not your main thing so people that do stumble upon your profile see that you can do it a follow-up question to that so for you i'm guessing you do have some pieces that you draw for fun and some pieces you draw for client work Do you feel like you have to change the way you think about drawing these things? And do you feel like you have a different process when you approach doing one or the other? Yeah, so lately, I haven't really had much time to draw for fun or for myself, which I'm not particularly complaining about because at the end of the day, like I'm getting commissions, which is super amazing and it's really rare for someone to be able to do this full time so i'm really grateful for it um but once in a while i do want to like take a little break from work and draw something for myself and i definitely do think it's different processes if that's a word um i think for merch illustration the most important part is to think of it as a piece that is going to be on a physical piece of something, like a t-shirt, a print, a pin, whatever. So you have to think of it like there's uh, layers of things you have to consider when you design a merch illustration rather than just something for Instagram. What you're saying is ideally you should have time to balance between the two. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think I am not like the best at balancing my work and kind of leisure time, but... Um, I definitely think it's healthy as an artist to take a break um, and kind of either get another hobby, which I'm also working on, or just take some time off to draw something that you want. Because often when working with clients, like, yeah, it's really exciting to work with a bunch of people and you're still drawing, so you're still doing the thing that you love. But Sometimes it gets um, creatively um, draining because like you still have to take the client into perspective because at the end of the day, that's the most important part of the project is the client and the client's needs. I think when you're working with yourself, if you decide to change direction, you can easily just do that without really worrying about it. But if you're working with a client, you have to think twice, do I want to spend the next three hours doing something and then with the possibility of the client saying, uh, no, I don't want this. This is not what I was talking about. I don't know. You work much faster than me, so I'm not so sure <laughs> if it's for you, it's a half an hour. But for me, if any change of direction, it's always like two or three hours gone. Oh, yeah. The, the idea that I work fast is very much just an illusion because as you said, you can't really just take creative control and be like oh you know what i'm gonna take this out or i'm not gonna draw this or i'm gonna change this whole thing completely because at the end of the day you have to like do what your client asked you and paid you to do so you can't as easily just scrap something or fully change it um do you mind me asking how much freedom do you usually get to express however you want so i want to say like pretty often now A lot of my clients um, kind of trust my vision and they trust my expertise, which is really nice. Obviously, there are exceptions to the case where a client really like knows what they want, which is honestly really great because it gives me like a very strict thing to follow. It doesn't let my mind wander, like, which is a bit more time efficient, I would say. But um, I do get quite a lot of creative freedom, which is really nice. A lot of my clients kind of just come up to me and they're like, do your worst, do your best, do whatever you want, which I really appreciate those types of clients. It's a double-edged sword for sure. But I think what's the scariest part is if the clients are like, oh, you're an expert and you can do your magic. So here's a grainy screenshot of my Instagram photo from 10 years ago and then make it into a masterpiece. Yeah, it definitely is a scary thing. A lot of times I kind of have to scrap pieces together and kind of collage them to like figure out how to make it work the most important part is to just like stalk the living shit out of them and just 
understand the way their face works and what their aesthetic is, what they're trying to convey. And yeah, it's a bit more work, but yeah, I don't mind it. I like that you mentioned this because something came up in my mind as soon as you said that um, not everybody has the luxury of having a strong brand and part of the artist's work and people might not appreciate this is that the artist might spend a lot of time trying to um, reduce the essence of every single photo into a single piece. So they're basically doing a branding exercise for you and those are the time that it's unseen on the artwork. Yeah, it's definitely, just like you said, it's kind of like a little branding exercise because a lot of queens kind of just lose that idea of sitting down and figuring out their own aesthetic because they kind of are afraid to be pigeonholed. So they kind of sometimes just fall into the other extreme where they just are attempting to go for too many aesthetics. They lose their brand and they lose their individuality. So like a lot of times I kind of just have to sit down and message my clients and be like, okay, what is your drag persona? Like, what do you want to convey? What is the the thing that you are? Like, what are you, basically? Which is a bit like of a existential question to ask a client, and it's a bit too dramatic for a little stupid merch illustration, but it's really important. So it's kind of like, okay, I understand that you're attempting to go for this aesthetic, um, even though currently you might not have the resources or the privileges or whatever to get that aesthetic, it's good that you mentioned that because I'm acknowledging what you're trying to go for and we're going to go for the fantasy that you want to achieve because that's the most important part to me specifically. I like to offer my clients the fantasy that they want. So it's just really understanding what they're going for. Yeah. As you're saying that, I'm thinking, actually, I keep asking myself, oh, what am I every day? So that's uh, <laughs> that's constant for me. And I'm sure any creative person will go through this existential crisis. Um, yeah, so going back to the main question, is there any big lesson that you've learned through your experience of working, doing merch with all these drag queens? I think a lesson that I'm still really trying to grasp um, that my friend Samuel Harrison taught me, um, or he's trying to teach me because I'm still not quite applying it as I should. But I think the most important thing is to respect yourself first and really stand your ground and really like cement yourself in your rights as an artist. Don't let people like treat you like shit just because you're a person on Instagram drawing drag queens for fun. So definitely, like, don't let anyone kind of talk down at you and, like, try to scam you for money and try to tell you how this is going to be so good for exposure and stuff like that. Definitely stand your ground and stand your ground in terms of work hours because we might be artists, but we're not here to break our backs for uh, fucking 24 hours just because someone needs their merch right now because that's unfair to ask of someone. Don't just ignore your safety and health and stuff like that because you have a big client because at the end of the day clients are just humans just like you so that's one of the biggest lessons put yourself first and you know demand respect yeah that's that's important know what you need for yourself to produce the best work possible yeah i definitely i definitely think i'm not there yet i i don't always kind of take my own advice which is a bad thing but um i still very much fall into that habit of overworking myself and kind of ignoring the fact that it's 3 a.m and i'm still here working on this commission um and not taking days off and sometimes undercharging because for some whatever reason um and i am getting better at cementing myself in this idea of like you know you're gonna respect me because i don't care that you've been on tv it's not that big of a thing if you really think about it like it's just a tv show i really want artists to like small artists to understand that it's not as intimidating as you think it is to interact with a tv person because 
we're all the same type of human. So don't let these people scare you away with big words or big followings and stuff like that. Just, yeah. Good luck with your uh, self-discovery. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's really good advice. Huh? Okay, <laughs> anyway, um, given that you are so experienced as well, I think you might be the best person to advise um, some artists on maybe some do's and don'ts when they're interacting with a TV personality or maybe some merch company. So is there something that artists should be aware about? So um, some of the rules that I am definitely following for myself is always get some money up front, no matter what. Don't send any sort of final file like HD, PNG, whatever to anyone unless you have money in your bank account. Do not start a piece unless you have been paid at least a deposit because respect my time. I'm not going to work for free unless I get paid. Read your contracts, for sure. Do not let people haggle your prices to the point where you are undercharging, which goes back to what I've been saying. Don't let them intimidate you with fancy big words and fancy big emails and name dropping and all this shit because it's not, it, it's not relevant. At the end of the day, this is an exchange of goods. And people have to understand that getting a custom piece of artwork made for yourself or for the person you represent is a luxury and you should pay the price of luxury. Not everyone can afford to get a little custom piece of art, so pay accordingly and don't try to pay an artist 10 pounds. I've been offered 10 pounds for a piece just because they've been on TV. Like, that's crazy because that's not even minimum wage. Like, that's insanity. <laughs> so definitely stay strong we should unionize honestly um yeah there's a few things i need to point out not only read your contracts properly but try to have a contract because it's better to have one regardless i think that's very important and there are resources outside for artists or new artists to just try to understand that before you do any work get a contract no definitely like really protect yourself legally and even if you don't understand how it works look it up the same way you learn how to draw, you can learn how to figure out legal stuff because that's the most important part. Like really read through what you're signing and have a contract that states, okay, I'm getting paid for this work for this date. Don't let anyone be like, oh, you owed me this drawing like a week ago. Where is it? Or stuff like that. So yeah, definitely like really stick to legal stuff. It's much better than raw dog in it. Yeah, and always remember that you can request for changes in a contract so just because someone gave you a uh, dog poop uh, you can say no there's a lot of work that goes into a piece that might not be physically visible like doing all this contract reading planning scheduling all these things are time spent to produce a piece so pay your artist okay no definitely it's whenever you think of prices it's kind of you're not just you have to realize as a client you're not just paying for the actual piece you're paying for the skill of the artist you're paying for their expertise it's not your place to judge how much their knowledge and artistry costs wait how how often does the haggling thing happen because i don't get enough clients to know how often it happens i know it does but i just want to know like is it very rare or it's very common <sighs> Oh. So <laughs> it happens quite often, I have to say. <laughs> but in my in my client's defense, um, I do understand that most of the time they are under a bigger company, like a management company, and they get a specific budget for a project to spend on merchandise. As an example, um, for DragCon, let's say one of the clients has a lot of bookings and they do make a lot of money, they still get a budget set by their managers or their managing team that they can spend on creating the booth so they can spend money on decorations. And then they get another piece of budget that they can spend on merchandise. And if they want to do pins, t-shirts, stickers, prints, everything, but they want different pieces for it, then they have to think, okay, like these pieces have to be cheaper um, so I can make multiple types of products. But if I want to spend more on a piece and I'm going to use that piece for 
multiple types of products, then they can splurge a little bit on the piece. So it's definitely like something you have to consider that it's not always as simple as this client is rich so they can afford to pay me thousands of dollars. Sometimes it, there's more things that go behind a um, person asking for a specific price, but that doesn't mean that you have to like leave your standards at the door just because this person has budget. So you have to think of it in a business perspective and don't get too offended by haggling or stuff like that because I do get it a lot and it is quite annoying sometimes, but you have to understand the other side and understand that they are also a business person. Yeah. Like next level, I've never experienced that like management team doing projects kind of thing. So that was probably an advice for an artist. Let's say you want to give an advice for a queen who's shopping for an artist. And oh, coincidentally, Bibardis is too busy. What they should be looking for uh, when they're shopping for an artist on Instagram. Any tips? If they're not shopping for you. Well, if they if I'm really that busy and I can't take the commission and they really have to go for someone else, <laughs> then I would say definitely look at the artist's portfolio. As I mentioned previously, what I would advise a client to do um, is really look at the way they are drawing, if they are drawing the type of person that you are. Because if an artist, which has happened many times, if an artist doesn't know how to draw people of color, um, then they're unlikely to get commissioned by people of color because they are unsure and they're scared that they're going to get drawn realistically or nicely. So definitely look at what they draw, how they draw it, if they draw it often, if they know how to merge their usual style with what you want, if there are different styles, look at if your styles are compatible. Look at the compatibility, oh, that's our word, um, of the artist and your drag aesthetic or your aesthetic as a person or what you're trying to convey. That said, go to be Bardis because why look further when you have the... Yeah, that being <laughs> the said, God, ignore yeah. everyone else. Do not ever <laughs> spend your money on any other artist. I'm the only one that matters. I am joking. If anyone is not catching the joke, this is a joke. I'm not... <laughs> Such a mean person, I swear. Um, yeah, okay. That That's really good advice. Um, once you pass the screening stage, um, is there any red flags that uh, uh, drag queens should watch out for when <laughs> interacting with an artist? The biggest red flag is kind of the same thing as what I just talked about is if they know how to draw a diverse group of people generally um, when drawing plus size queens, they kind of tend to slim them down. Um, even though I don't think every single time it's kind of from a malicious point of view, I think a lot of times is either trying to flatter them because they think that the person doesn't want to be as plus size as they are, um, or they it's just a lack of knowledge, which happens a lot because whenever we learn anatomy, a lot of anatomy courses don't teach how to draw different body types. So I do definitely think it's like a mix of lack of knowledge and a lot of other stuff. But sometimes I have noticed it's just kind of blatant ignorance, um, especially when it comes to plus size people, as I said, and even skin tones, which shouldn't be a thing at this point. Like it's not that difficult. Especially if the brand of the queen is their body size, then I think that's something that you should celebrate. Um, yeah, I, I do admit that um, sometimes I draw people in their non-skin color. I do try to um, change things up. <laughs> I do think like there there's a line there because sometimes you like push colors and do a different like lighting source so it affects the skin tone and that's fine. But there's a lot of cases where you, the, the person is gray, like it shouldn't like... <laughs> Unless the concept is that the person is great. I don't get it. Like, <laughs> it has to have reasoning and you have to understand how lighting interacts with every skin tone. So definitely do your research yeah. on that. I don't think every case is malicious again, but, you know, practice. Yeah. Um, I think among artists, you can tell whether they're not doing it because they are unknowledgeable about it. If someone keeps drawing all their poses with their hands in their pocket, it's very clear that they don't know how to draw hands. And I got a confession. 
I don't really enjoy drawing little rhinestones and jewelry and stuff. And you will see, I tend to avoid that as much as I can. Those are my mortal enemy as well. Like rhinestones. But you do this so well. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So, so I have a love-hate relationship with rhinestones. Sometimes they do very weird anatomy poses, whatever. And sometimes there's a bit of the body that kind of looks a bit empty. So sometimes it's great to just like stick a clump of little rhinestones on there. But then you have to remember that you have to paint them. And painting reflective tiny surfaces is a pain in the fucking ass. So it's kind of annoying. <laughs> but they look good. So you can't really like do anything about that. So you just like learn how to do it. <laughs> Just get the most efficient way to draw <laughs> rhinestones and stick with it, which is what I've done. I feel like there's a few things that I try to avoid, like little rhinestones, patterns, any fur or texture. I try to stay away as well because it's so much work. Oh yeah, I can't do, I still can't do patterns. <laughs> I mean, if there's a client that wants it, yes, I'll do it. But if it's my own personal work that I draw for fun, I will yeah, stay no. away from it. This is not fun territory for me. Okay, great. So after this, I'm going to commission um, a <laughs> raccoon dressed in plaid that is fully encrusted in rhinestones for you. Just, oh, I'm going to so, commission you. Yes. So. <laughs> Size of an happen. elephant. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I didn't know you hate me so much. I'm going to quit art tomorrow bye finally okay well anyway <laughs> i i'm not so sure in preparation of this is that something that people should take away from um this whole topic in general i think just be respectful in general no matter what perspective you're seeing this from whether you're an artist or drag queen or any sort of client trying to work with an artist just be fucking respectful because i get so many people that just forget that I am just a tiny little human on my phone talking to you. Like, it's not like I'm some sort of multimillionaire company. Just be respectful, be human, be understanding. Just don't be a cunt, basically. <laughs> and have fun. I think sometimes the process can be and fun. Artists and drag queens alike, I think if you give yourself enough time to play, you will have a lot of fun through this process. Explore. I think the exploration process can be quite enjoyable. Unless the deadline is a week away, then it gets very tense and the product sometimes suffer. Yeah, I do. I do get a lot of short deadlines, but I still try to like enjoy the process because, again, shit happens. You have to understand that you're working with a lot more people than just a little drag queen. And you can't always control the deadline that you're getting. Sometimes you just have to like do it. Don't like sacrifice your health for it, but sometimes you do have to, you know, not go out for one night so you can finish a commission, which is not the end of the world. So Oh, maybe is that an experience that you had that was extremely positive? Or negative, that's what we love. Uh, is there an experience that you particularly enjoy or not doing this? So I'm not going to talk about the negatives because I'm trying to <laughs> stay more positive this year. <laughs> um, because there's been plenty of those. Do not get me wrong. There's been a lot of negative um, situations. You're on your all-stars uh, return, try to rebrand. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now I am trying to go for Miss Congeniality in my all star season. I do not afford filler yet, but we're getting there. So when I come to All-Stars the third time around, then we're going to get my full villain experience. But um, yeah, I definitely think learn from your, even from your bad experiences, because any situation that you're in, good or bad, you have something to learn from it. But I think one of my favorite experiences that I've had working with drag queens was actually last year um, at DragCon. I had worked with Isis Couture because the way she talked to me as I was like a peer to her, um, she didn't really like talk to me like I was just some little worker for her and stuff like that. She was very collaborative and she was really, you know, working with me, not for her. And Respectful. like getting to meet her at DragCon, it was such a crazy, crazy experience. I couldn't get in the first day because she had such a huge line of people at her booth. 
And then in the second day, she messaged me, why haven't I come to her booth? And I was like, well, I can't get in because there's so many people out here. Like, come on. Like, what do you mean? And she sent her manager out for me, which was so crazy because I don't think of myself as this like famous illustrator thing because I'm not. And seeing that she sent her actual manager to like get me in to just like pause everyone that was waiting in line, which felt so bad. Like I felt so, so bad for that. But I could see everyone just turning around and looking at who is this cunt that is cutting in line. Like this is so annoying. Who is this? And then she just came out of her little uh, curtain thing that she had set up and she was just hugging me and like talking to me like we're friends. And it was such a crazy oh. thing. And that was kind of like when I had a little switch in my brain where I was like, oh, like some of these people actually respect me for who I am and what I do and the work that I put in. And it, it kind of like made me realize like, you know what, maybe I am actually okay at this job like maybe i'm not just shit at everything you know so it was kind of a, a cathartic moment so yeah she's she's been amazing oh that's so sweet half the time nobody even knows how we look like behind the artwork no that was literally a thing that i was struggling at dry as well with the my physical appearance because i don't usually just post myself out there so a lot of my clients especially because with the algorithm they don't get to see every single one of my posts or stories or stuff like that so when I went to drag con and, and I mostly just went to the booths that I had merch at because I'm conceited. <laughs> so I went to the booth and like some of the queens didn't know what I looked like, but obviously we had interacted because they did their merch. And then I would just sit there and be like, how do I mention to this person that I, I am who I am? Not in the sense of like, oh, do you know who I am? It's more in the sense of like, we're, you know, friends slash acquaintances like, hey, by the way, this is me. You know what I mean? So I had a couple a couple of cases at Dragon last year where, where they were just like, oh shit, hi, like, wh- oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, definitely the, the thing of uh, being recognized is kind of weird as an artist because you don't get recognized for your face, really. It's more your work. Yeah, and it's them if you do, them if you don't. Because if you don't say anything, that it, it's like so creepy as well. Yeah, literally. Um, yeah, except the responses I get is more like, Ah, okay. <laughs> it's not oh, as on. exciting for me. <laughs> no, I'm just, oh, I'm just saying it. It's not like it happened. I'm just, yeah, I'm just making things up in my head at this moment. We've come to act three of the show, and I'm just gonna ask you some random questions. So sure. feel free to answer them however you like. Are you ready? I've never been. More okay. Ready. If you had to survive a zombie apocalypse with any three drag queens, who would you choose and why? Ooh, love a zombie apocalypse, first of all. That would be my pick for the apocalypse. Um, I've watched so many zombie apocalypse shows that I need to think of this in the most practical, survivalist way. Who's the richest? Okay, RuPaul first, because she has prob she probably has a bunker somewhere for money something rich um then kennedy davenport because she was in the navy so she can definitely kick some ass and she can make good food so definitely her and i think maybe utica because she's kind of like crazy as shit and she's also crafty so i feel like that's a useful trait to have i mean she made a gown from sleeping bags like if anything we're gonna look great during the apocalypse so so yeah rupaul kennedy and utica i love your answer it's very thought out um yeah i just love a zombie apocalypse what is your second favorite apocalypse if it's not a zombie Ooh. one I feel like something quick because I can deal with anything else. And we are kind of going through a very slow apocalypse at the moment. So none none of this. Just something really quick. Like a, a fucking comet, something hitting the earth and just wiping everyone off. Like just some quick. Because I can't, I can't deal with Easy. any ice age or anything. I can't. It's either the zombies or nothing. <laughs> Well, um, I hope that there's someone out there that might be inspired by this ensemble and then draw a, a fan art of this. Oh my god, please. I would die to see this. So you're you're in the UK. <laughs> Do you surprise the English folks uh, when they find out that you're from Romania? I always, you know, they're always kind of 
shocked that I'm Romanian whenever I like meet new people here, which is kind of crazy to me because I don't see myself as the most, I don't know, ambiguous looking person. Um, in the summer, I get tanned or I have curly hair or like tiny stuff like this that to me are so common. I guess my English is not what they've heard Eastern Europeans to sound like because they're used to the very comical, like, Russian accent that is done in TV and media where it's like a very heavy accent. Um, obviously, I do have a slight accent, but it's harder to catch it because I don't sound like a babushka, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, yeah bless them. <laughs> not their fault. Yeah. Well, if you told them that you slept upside down like this, they probably would believe you. I mean, I look the part, so... <laughs> So anyway, before we end the show, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me today. Yes. I hope you had fun. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I hope that uh, by the next time we talk to each other, I will have uh, 20,000 more followers than you. Hopefully. Take that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to bully <laughs> all five of the followers that still see my posts to go follow you. So we're going to get you there. We're going to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, thanks Bibardis and thank you all for listening to Canvases and Queens. Please subscribe and never miss another episode. And maybe we might get Bibardis back. Who knows? Uh, Bibardis, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram only at Bibartis, B-I-B-A-R-T-I-S because I'm too lazy to make any other social media accounts. Yeah, I hate, I hate TikToks. Um... <laughs> Join me again in the next episode. And until then, keep it artsy and stay fartsy. Bye. It is what it is. You know, life's not fair, okay? Yeah. Hello.